get up there in big words. I can just do it. Don't worry about it. Uh, I think we'll get started. I was told that uh, there was no one here to introduce myself, and since it's five, or introduce me, and since it's five after, I can uh, just get started so we're not late for dinner. Um, so this is Moving Beyond Programmer, Succeeding in the Video Game Industry. Um, the uh, main focus here is how you get from programmer to software engineer and how I'm defining the gap and the difference between these two and why it's important to your career. <laughs> because a uh, software engineer tends to think in bigger ideas, bigger pictures, has more responsibility and more control that comes with that. Uh, it's about making yourself valuable, making yourself employable, um, and basically to take on larger projects and satisfy that, that desire that you have to build things and make things that is the reason you probably got into computer science in the first place. Uh, to be clear, I am not talking about how to get into the management track, although it's a completely valid path. No, honest, it is. Um, or necessarily how to become a good team lead or anything like that. Uh, these are all valid career decisions, um, and you'd be surprised five or six years down the road when you might decide to look at those, uh, those paths and those options. But this is more about how you become, you know, the old crazy guy in the corner that knows everything, or, you know, the one that everyone just goes to when they have a question. Okay, so, before we get there, though, who am I and why are you listening to me? Um, my academic career started, I got my bachelor's in science here. I was here from 92 to 96. Um, most of my CS undergrad took place in this room. We had these chairs even back then. <laughs> these chairs are probably as old as most of you. <laughs> uh, I realized at this time most of you were probably learning to walk. Um, it was a bit of a different world back then. Uh, I can definitely say that I spent more time in the ACM office than I did in classroom. Um, I, did, I, I probably sacrificed many a grade to work on projects and stuff uh, uh, in the office. The very first Reflections Projection Conference was my senior year in 1995. Got my t-shirt still. <laughs> um, there's some good stories about why this conference came to exist and how much we ticked off ACM International in doing so. But uh, I think we won the argument since the conference is still around and quite successful, I might add. Um, back, <laughs> if you would have you know, gone back to then and shown how fly by night and just off the cuff that first conference was, it's truly amazing to see what it's turned into. Uh, let's see. So yeah, um, my involvement in the conference was, uh, I came up with the name. And the original name of the conference was, in fact, the Midwestern ACM Student Chapter Conference. Uh, Reflections Projections was actually supposed to be the theme for the first year. That was the part that was supposed to change every year. <laughs> uh, about 1998, uh, they finally realized that uh, the Midwestern name sucked and this was much better. And so it has been named Reflections Projections since. Um, I was also one of the uh, original two programmers on the MacMania contest, which was also supposed to be a one-year theme. But anyways, okay, so this was a very, very interesting four years. As was mentioned in the last one, in early uh, 93 is when Mosaic came out. At this point, there was maybe 20 websites in the whole world. At this point, Coke was putting URLs in the back of their cans. The evolution that we saw here was probably the fastest adaptation of a media in the entire history of the human race. We were seeing growth rates. I, for the last two years, I actually worked at NTSA uh, on Mosaic and the server project, uh, HD2PD, which went on to become the basis of Apache. Um, we were seeing growth rates at that time of the web and something in the order of 50% per week compound. You cannot graph this. It's a vertical line no matter what. It's just, it was a really amazing, amazing time. If you were at the last, um, last speak to, or last talk, 
I also was lucky enough that at SIGGRAPH 94, this summer between my sophomore and junior year, uh, I actually had a chance to build the third cave in the world, which was located in Argonne National Lab. Lots of interesting things going on. Um, let's see. The job market was also really, really nice. I had my first full-time job offer on the table, good for 18 months, the weekend before Thanksgiving. Makes your senior year a breeze. <laughs> I really wish you guys were in the same situation. <laughs> uh, what I did end up eventually doing was I went to a small firm in Dallas called Paradigm Simulation. They were a large value-added reseller for SGI, which is a company most of you have probably never heard of. Um, they were the definitive company for high-end computer graphics at the time. They built multi-million dollar systems. Uh, if you were into graphics, they were the people you wanted to work for. In and what happened was this, this company uh, built a simulation product on top of this that did you know, vehicle simulation for, for trains, airplanes, cruise ships, um, just about anything you can imagine. SGI designed the graphics chip in the Nintendo 64 console unit. S and so Nintendo came to SGI and said, who do you know that's really good at 3D graphics and is not necessarily a game designer, but is a firm that can really show the strengths of this product. Is we ought to talk to these people in Dallas, and so they did. And Paradigm did one of the two release titles, Pilot Wing 64, for the Nintendo 64 console. For those of us that had joined, uh, well, there was an internal conflict here because you kind of had people working on the games who were running around in you know, ripped jean shorts and t-shirts and bare feet. And then you have the people doing the high-end simulation that are doing you know, aircraft simulators for four-star generals from other countries, and they'd come in to visit and do site visits, and like, don't pay attention to those people. That's not what we're about. <laughs> and so there was kind of a cultural clash there. And at some point, the managers all went around and said, you know, okay, what do you want to do? Do you want to do games, or do you want to do simulation? And I told my manager, I want to do one game. I want to just say, I have done a game. And then I want to go back to the simulation work, because Because uh, you know, I don't need that stress. I don't need that scheduling. Um, but I want to say I've done it, you know. And so I was assigned to a game team. And a few months later, the company split in two, and I was on the wrong side of the fence. So suddenly, I found myself working in the entertainment industry, not exactly by choice. <laughs> um, At Paradigm Entertainment, I got involved in a lot of uh, large networking projects, and they went on to be quite successful. But I began to realize that it was just not happening for me. Um, and I eventually left Paradigm Entertainment saying I would never, ever, ever work in the entertainment industry again. Nobody knew what they were doing. So I spent eight years at Sites. Sites, for those of you not from uh, U of I, Sites is the, uh, I don't know what it actually stands for anymore, but it's the academic computing group, runs the networks, runs the email, runs all that kind of stuff. Basically everything but payroll and uh, class rosters and that kind of thing. Um, mostly what I did was, I was a programmer there. Uh, let's see. A lot of web work for the first time. Database work, did a lot of stuff with the campus DNS system. Uh, got into writing um, monitoring and reporting tools for the networking systems. Uh, the campus exit gateway, for example, we sample traffic that goes through there and build statistical models and that kind of thing. I worked a lot on the uh, data logging system for all this. Uh, academic work is very different than industry. And, and sites is unusual in the fact that they're not actually an academic or research unit, right? They're a support unit. But you still get a lot of the flavor for academia. And after eight years, I kind of had to say to myself, you know, this is not for me. They're, they're a service organization, and I want to go build things. And those are kind of in conflict with each other. They really didn't know how to use me well. Um, it was just time to move on. Basically, I said, okay, I have learned all there is to learn here. I need to find something new. I was in the position, though, that I didn't want to leave this area. I would moved back from Dallas to uh, move in with my then future wife, got married while I was in sites. She had a very established career. I had no desire to change that or upset that. So I was looking for any place in town that had interesting problems to solve. One of the place, few places in town is a game studio called Volition. 
uh, you might know them. They did. They started out with the Descent, was one of their big, big ones way back when. Um, Summoner. There's a quite a free space. The, the, there's also well known. Um, anyways, been around a while, well established. But this meant getting back into games, and I was not so sure about that. Uh, you know, I'd said, look, I'm never going to do this again. I don't really consider myself a gamer, and so it would be quite ironic to, for the second time in my career, end up working for a game studio. Uh, especially in an industry that a lot of people fight to get in, and I was like, oh, do I really want to go back? <laughs> um, there were some things that convinced me, though, okay, we'll try this. Because they definitely had interesting problems. And I had a pretty good idea of what I was getting into. But there are little things that you pick up after a while. You know, touring the studio, there was a poster up that had, you know, the art team goals for this title, like six bullet points, maybe a dozen words each. The fact that that poster was there meant a lot to me, though. It meant somebody cared about communications. Someone cared about, you know, team cohesiveness. The interview process itself was very powerful. Every step, and it was a long process, but every step in that process, it's like, that's a really good question, and it's a hard question, and I know why you're asking me this question. Most importantly, if I get through all this to the end, that means I only have to work with people that were smart enough to get through all this. Uh, so the interview process itself was a really powerful motivator, as well as just the management. Good group of people. I mean, quite frankly, as they were people I wanted to work for. And once I did start there again, I realized that I had made a mistake with my, you know, with Paradigm. What I didn't like there, the management falling apart in my view, things like that. What was happening is the company was being so successful they were barely holding on. Now, in business, this is a really good problem to have, but it is a highly destabilizing problem. And when you're just a few years out of school and you just want to go out and build cool things and you're not wanted worrying about management and cash flow and clients and all this stuff, just leave me alone with my compiler. Uh, it's very easy to view those things as, you know, management has no idea what they're doing. No, management's just really holding on by their fingernails. And so I realized that much of my distaste for the industry was not actually about the industry. So I started and said, okay, I'll be here two years or ten, depending on how much it, you know, I like this environment. I've been there five, so it's working out. Uh, got to work on Red Faction Gorilla. I was the head vehicle programmer for that. Um, did all the physics, all the vehicles, weapons, turrets, a lot of stuff like that. Did a little work on Red Faction Armageddon, which came out last year. And then shifted into a role that I'm doing now. I don't technically work for Volition anymore, even though that's where I go to work every day. I technically work for our corporate uh, owner, THQ, and do uh, databases, networks, a lot of things that are not very sexy and exciting, but are actually a much better fit for my skill level. Um, Things that were very different about academia was to work on a huge team that was all pointed in the same direction, had the same goals and the same support structure behind it. It's great to be that way. Have a solid team that clearly all wants to you know, get to the same point, ship a great product. There's often a lot of arguments about the best path to that goal, but that's just part of development. So that's my career. Um, during this time, however, I was also doing contract work for O'Reilly Media, the uh, technical book publisher that I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with. This had started, uh, my, one of my managers at Sites had written a book for O'Reilly many years ago that was quite successful. And uh, he knew they were looking for someone to do the second edition of System Performance Tune. I wasn't interested in that, but a, a friend of ours were, was, and he had me do some review work. And I said, you know, got out my big red pen and said, okay, you know, you got problems here, blah, 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 and on and on and on. Handed it back to him. He actually really appreciated it. Thought, okay, you know, this is good, solid feedback. And a few weeks later, O'Reilly had a need to have their first wireless book go through review. It was about a 400-page book, very technical, digs deep, deep, deep down into, you know, radio signals, packet headers, all this kind of thing. Oh, and by the way, you have three days to read the entire thing and do the review. Sure, why not? 
<laughs> it was over Christmas break. Printed it out, got out a couple of red pens, marked it all up, sent it off to the author, and I felt really bad because we, le we left a lot of ink on the page and really ripped it to pieces. Some of the networking stuff was just, no, you're like, totally wrong on this concept. Um, and it's difficult to stand up and you know tell someone that you're doing this thing that I really respect for this company I really like, and by the way, you suck at it. <laughs> <laughs> But it turned out the author loved it. And at the time, I didn't understand that. But the, the author and the editor were like, wow, this has been tremendously useful. And I built up a relationship with the editor. Did uh, At this point, I've done well over a, a half dozen technical reviews. I'm in the middle of one right now for a Redis book that's coming out in December, maybe. <laughs> They've been slow. I uh, started to write a book in 2004 on cluster computing. Uh, unfortunately, it was canceled. O'Reilly canceled almost every book they had in production with the collapse of the internet bubble in, you know, 0203. Took me a while to recover from that. Got to talking to them about writing some networking stuff. Didn't really like the direction it was going. Was looking for a simple, easy, quick book to write just to see if I could do it. Had a bit of a light bulb, you know. I was working on some APIs or, or a programming project trying to understand some APIs for uh, SQLite. And really was just like, this is, shouldn't be that hard. There should be a book about this, you know, ding, right? So in uh, August of last year, my first book was published um, using SQLite. For those of you who are that are O'Reilly fans, the answer to your first question is white heron. It's a subspecies of the great blue heron. The answer to your second question is no, I did not get to pick and that's a whole story into itself. <laughs> uh, there is a very weird dance that happens with covers, and the author is not invited. Uh, so, enough about me. What is modern game development all about? I should also say that mostly what I'm focusing on is PC, consoles, uh, Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, that type of thing. Um, in the past couple of years, <coughs> The game industry has expanded enormously to include areas that just didn't exist a couple of years ago. You know, Flash games have become a very real thing. Facebook games. <laughs> Zynga is worth more than most traditional publishers put together. I mean, their capital is just huge. And that whole concept didn't exist a few years ago. But for the most part, I'm talking about pretty traditional, you know, AAA console development. Uh, mostly, it's about big teams, big budgets, and managing lots and lots of risk. So, when I left Paradigm in 1998, this is what a very, very respectable title looked like. I'm not talking about, you know, the blockbuster that came out of nowhere, but this is definitely a very large undertaking. Uh, we're looking at 20 people. About a third of those are programmers. About two-thirds are artists with the producer or a scheduler or something thrown in there. Uh, two and a half million dollar budget. That's from day one, we want to build this game until here's a CD with the game on it. I'm not including production costs, I'm not including marketing costs, I'm not including you know, shipping and handling to retailers, uh, first party licensing, all of those even back then, another 20 million maybe. So this is just feeding the development team essentially. One and a half years, sell it in the store for 50 bucks. Sure, go out and make a lot of money. Okay, 12 years later, team sizes are up to 100 people. Budget for an average decent sized game, $35 million. And again, that's just, here's the DVD with the finished product. Now we're looking at $60 million to get it into the store with a decent marketing campaign. It takes three years to build, now we're selling it for $60. The 35 million looks big, but I would point out that if you make the team size five times as big, and you keep them around twice as long, that's an easy 25 million. Uh, inflation, games are bigger, they're more complicated. The rest says, okay, 35 million. It's that bottom number that's really scary. <laughs> okay, this is not inflation adjusted, but still. You're laying out a whole lot more money. You're not charging a lot more. You better sell a heck of a lot more of these things if you want to stay in business very long. If you're developing titles of this size, you can't screw up. 
not many companies can sink $35 million and stay in business very long. Uh, that also means the risks associated with every single title are significant. Partially what that means is out of that 100 people on the team, uh, you have now have formal project managers. You have task managers. You have a much larger production staff that's overseeing all this. Much bigger diversity in the teams. A lot more disciplines that are broken up. Uh, you will come in, I mean, they are, these are serious managed software projects, okay? Multi-year, you will come in every day and have a task list for that sprint. And volition, they're typically like four to six weeks. You have a list of stuff that you're supposed to get done. You better have a darn good reason why it's not been done at the end of the month. And you know, then the cycle repeats. It also means that if the schedule starts to slip and things aren't happening as fast as they should, that feature that you really love, that you think defines the game, there's the calendar, there's the budget, how much time is it going to take? Yes, no, gone. Happens all the time. This is actually a good thing. Any of you that have been interested in games are probably aware of this thing called crunch and horror stories of 120 hour weeks and all this kind of thing. It happens. It's part of the deal. But if you manage your projects well, it's not a surprise. There are definitely, you know, sort of the old school folks that are like, just leave me alone and I'll get it done. It's like, no, that doesn't work with teams this size, okay? It works with three guys in a garage. When you're willing to give up your whole life for the last month, and when you're, you know, your, your ship date can slip by a few weeks and you don't blow a $20 million marketing campaign, it doesn't work in today's world. So having that formal management where you know, like I said, you know, every day you come in, that's what I got to get done. No questions asked. If I have an issue with that, I'm blocking on this. I take it to my manager and say, you, you have a problem you need to solve here. You know, everything gets prioritized. It gets taken care of. It's not probably as glamorous as the whole idea of, you know, three people in a garage just hacking away, but it ships and you get a paycheck and stay in business. So, you know, it's all good in the end, right? Uh, and if you're really lucky and you sell a whole bunch of copies and you pull the whole thing off and you're greatly successful, your reward is you stay in business and you get to do it again. <laughs> okay, so teams. Teams are very, very cross-disciplined these days. Uh, just off the top of my head, you know, these are rough categories that I would break employees into. Um, every one of these categories, in addition to you know, the people actually doing the work, would also have leaders. You'd have coordinators with all this. So modelers, okay, they build models and painters. In our studio, if you model it, you texture it. That's not true in all studios. In some cases, those disciplines are actually broken apart. Uh, we've got audio teams that create, you know, Every line of audio that's recorded, every piece of music that isn't licensed, even the small stuff, you know, tire squeals, whatever. They have to build it all, just like the modelers have to build all the visuals. Uh, designers that actually build the game, decide what's fun, design the missions, design the levels. Uh, Volition employs two writers. One of them has a degree in theater. Because he write, learned to write screenplays. He's great. Um, not only does he understand story arcs and all these traditional things, he knows how to work with actors, which when you're recording lines is kind of important because when you spend a boatload of money on Hollywood talent and rent a studio for you know $2,000 an hour, it helps to have someone who knows how to get lines to tape really fast. Uh, we have animators that take all those models and things and you know provide motion. Uh, production staff, of course producer, assistant producer, all those people. They kind of have the gophers for everything and ultimately make most of the decisions. As I said, project managers have become a huge part. I mean, 10% of our team are project managers, typically. They are acting as the go-betweens between all these people. You know, task lists. This artist needs to finish this model before the animator can animate with it, before the, you know, programmers are dealing with getting it in game, before the mission designers can use that as, you know, all of these dependencies, these massive webs of dependencies, and the project managers can figure it all out. Uh, QA, as I'm sure you know, playing the game that you're building for 50 hours a week is the most surefire way to guarantee that you will hate everything to do with that game by the time it ships. 
Um, it's not nearly as glamorous as anything you've ever heard about it. It's, it's tedious, it's low pain, it's uh, very hard in the middle of crunch week when you know that person's been here for 10 hours a day for the last you know, week and a half to come to them and say, yeah, you know that thing that you're working on? Guess what? I broke it again. Uh, and of course, there are programmers that make it all come together. Even the programmers have a lot of specialization. Um, that isn't to say that you know, once you launch your career, you're stuck in one of these roles. But we tend not to like to move people around, certainly on a single title. But generally, once you kind of find your niche, you might take over you know, one, one and a half of these areas and kind of float around. But they're definitely specializations. Rendering, uh, they're totally off on their own. <laughs> they live in a world that the rest of us don't understand. Uh, physics guys, vehicle people, um, those two are highly related. Most of vehicle programming is dealing with physics. You'd be surprised how much physics you're dealing with. I mean, when I was doing vehicles, it was calculus every day because you're just dealing with them at a very, very core level. Uh, AI programmers that do their own kind of magic that most of us don't understand. Uh, gameplay, which is a nice way of saying the, uh, the grunt guys at the bottom of the ladder that get any task thrown at them. Uh, audio programmers obviously deal with uh, assets and audio rendering. Um, and of course, tools. Tools are a huge thing. Uh, unfortunately ignored by most studios, or at least not prioritized as much as it can. You want your artists to get work done, and most of your team is artists. If you want your artists to get their work done and get it quickly, you need to have good tools. And since the, program, or since the artists tend not to be technical, they don't complain very much. And they should. There's plenty of times when I've seen situations where you know an artist is pounding away on something like, why do you do this really weird step that takes you 20 minutes? It's like, well, and you're like, why don't you just tell someone? You should have worn a collared shirt, apparently. <laughs> Let me see if that works. Uh, and very often it's, un, you know, unfortunately it's like some program, what ha you know, it, it always happens, like you're at beer, having a beer or something after work, like, yeah, I had this terrible day, comes out to some program and they're like, oh yeah, it take five minutes to fix. You know? <laughs> um, okay, so the one thing to understand though is programmers are at the bottom of the totem pole. In some cases we're not even that, we're the guy off to the side, right? Programmers serve everyone else on the team. Everyone else on the team are our customers. We have to make them happy. We exist to bring the game designer's ideas to life. We exist to take that model of the vehicle and you know, run it across the racetrack and make it look awesome. We exist to bring the audio to life. We, ex you know, it's, we exist to make everyone else's dreams become a reality. <laughs> uh, and, and that's a critical point too. It used to be that programmers kind of did everything and took responsibility for everything, and that's, it's, with teams these size, it's split. And one of the things that's really difficult for a lot of young programmers to accept is the game designers are there to design the game. I'm sure you have a great idea. You can go talk to them. They will listen to you. In most studios, it's a very open environment. Cross discipline is what it's all about. Good idea is a good idea, no matter who it came from. But at the end of the day, they get to make the decisions. The designers make the decisions about what the game is going to look like, how it's going to play, not the programmers. And a lot of people have friction with that. Programmers get to decide how it works inside, and they can build all the neat little algorithms and stuff they want. But in terms of what the product is to the customer, game designers are fair. Now, there's, there is a fairly established precedent of programmers sort of migrating to game design. Occasionally it even works, but uh, so yeah, bottom of the totem pole, like I said, everyone else is our customer. Now the good news is programmers are still paid more than everyone else, except production, but it's good though. Okay, so that's what modern game development is about. Getting back to our problem here, how do we bridge this gap between programmer and software engineer? Uh, let's let's start by defining what I'm saying by this. Okay, programmer, you're thinking more junior, thinking in smaller problems. Okay, you know, chief chief issue is you come in and write code. You're thinking in functions and small tasks. 
maybe you know, designing a class, designing one or two classes that interact with them. Really straightforward, very close to the actual task and operation of writing code. The software engineer is engineering things. So the programmer is more of a carpenter. Software engineer is an architect. They're thinking about systems, not problems. Uh, instead of thinking in you know, an individual class, you're thinking in a whole class hierarchy. How does every single item in the game fit together? How does the, you know, the file system loader deal with the audio system when they're competing? Both of those things are semi-real time. You know, on and on and on. Much bigger mindset. The programmer is dealing in micro decisions. Right? You're writing code. How do I set up this loop? How do I set up this function? The software engineer is dealing with <coughs> big scope issues. Which isn't to say that they, they still have to be darn good programmers. But they're dealing in much bigger systems. This is kind of a, a hard concept to understand. Um, it might be better illustrating it with this. So as many of you probably know, there's this classic, classic book on software engineering called Mythical Man Month. See, it's right there in the title, Software Engineering. <laughs> uh, if you haven't read this book, you really should. Yes, it was written in 1972. That was before even I was born. Yes, it deals with assembly on mainframes. Doesn't matter. Because the book is really about the process of building software, the fact that it's assembly code and not Java, and the fact that it's on mainframes instead of iPhones, totally irrelevant. All the lessons in here are really good. Core idea of this whole book is on page five is this diagram. And this is the idea that there's a cost associated with building a program. Okay, this is what the compiler spits out, right? Congratulations, you have an EXE. That costs you a unit, whatever that might be. If you would like to turn that into a shippable product, you have to add an installer. You have to write a manual. You have to bring the user interface of the program up to the point where somebody will actually use it. Your costs just went up by a factor of three. If you want to turn this basic program into an application, a usable environment, something that you know, supports plugins, that supports multiple file formats, is something other than a very basic utility. Okay? It's gone from you know, the one interesting algorithm with just enough code wrapped around it to get files in and data back out to something that's actually a usable tool to do productive work. Okay? That is a three times cost as well. By the time you get down here, where you have a shippable application, you essentially have uh, you know, an order of magnitude and cost. You probably don't believe this, but trust me, it is true. <laughs> uh, you know, in 19, it, I, I, I would agree with the idea that perhaps an order of magnitude is a, a tad high these days. Um, we have tools to build installers, for example. Okay. Manuals are mostly web pages online. The very traditional 1972 model may not apply in exact numbers. But the main thing is to get from this square to this square, you have a significantly larger support and production cost. And it isn't about the program itself, right? You already wrote that. You already got the core interesting bit. It's about everything else that goes with it to actually get this thing out the door. Programmers deal with this square. Software engineers deal with this square. And that is perhaps the best way to say it. Um, more details on exactly what all this means is, well, there's no substitute for experience. I guess mostly what I'm trying to do here is let you accelerate that experience when you, uh, when you encounter it. So, okay. People work the same way. Um, and, and, you know, I was kind of explaining this, but again, this person is dealing with, I want to write code. Here's the problem I'm trying to solve. Software engineer with the shippable product is dealing with, I need to maintain this code. Oh, we found a bug, and I need to backport it to the previous version and the current version. And I need to test both. And I need to be sure that I didn't break anything. And I need to be sure that you know, six months down the road, when we actually implement the features we have on our feature list, we're not going to go back and break this again. Code maintainability is a huge thing that you never worry about until you're actually shipping a product, in which case you realize it dominates everything that you do. 
very likely you have a team by the time you get down here, probably a pretty big team. So now you're dealing with coordinating that team, with managing that team. Be sure that everyone has the same vision, the same goals, all that kind of stuff. You're worried about product rollout. You have a target date that you need to hit. You have, you know, things that you need to give to marketing so that they can convince people to spend their money on your product. Uh, it's not necessarily about it. We had an issue in the studio that was basically like we had a team lead who was so focused on building a game. We needed a team lead that was focused on building a product. You know, every time marketing came and said, oh, there's this huge conference or this huge magazine visit, we need a demo. Oh, this is going to blow the whole development schedule. You know, why do you keep bothering me? It's like, you know, it would be great to build the perfect game and build it under budget and, you know, before the deadline and we all take a month off. And then nobody will buy it because our marketing team had nothing to work with. <laughs> nobody knows it existed. So you have this wonderful, beautiful game that's sitting in a box. It just doesn't work that way. You have to build products. You have to work with your teams. And sometimes that, you know, like I said, that jump from you are building a product and everything that goes with it, not necessarily just an application. Okay, so how do we get from a programmer to software engineer? Well, the first step is get to the first step. Um, I'll get a little more into this later. But you really can't get beyond some of these ideas if you can't, if you don't get your basic coding skills down. You need to be able to build small things before you try to build big things. Uh, many people that graduate with a CS degree can't do this, okay? I don't know about your programs or your schools, but I know here I got a degree in computer science, not software engineering, not software development. They spent a whole lot of time teaching me algorithms and teaching me how processors work and how cache coherency is important and search algorithms and all this kind of stuff. And I had to do homework and write programs, but they never really got around to teaching me how to program. They said, oh yeah, here's this language you need to learn and then here's this homework you need to do in this language. But I never had a class that actually focused on what is good penmanship in writing code. Most of us figure it out. A lot of us don't. The fact that you're one of those motivated people that is actually at this conference means that you probably have. Congratulations. <laughs> but step one is definitely you need to figure out what's going on before we get beyond it. Getting beyond it is not about writing code. Most of the steps about getting beyond programmer, about filling out your career, making those big moves, getting more responsibility is not about writing code. It's about building larger pieces of software. And how you do that really isn't about, you know, I learned a new trick or I learned a new operator or I learned a new optimization. It's bigger issues. They're also basic issues. Uh, it sounds a little weird to go back to this, but the three R's are very important and very, very defining in your ability to go beyond code monkey, to go beyond programming. We'll take this in reverse order. Arithmetic first. Computers do math. Computers move numbers around. That's it. That's all they do. At the end of the day, everything is abstracted to a number. In games, you know, colors, textures, images, positions, you know, the vertices of the model, velocities, inertia tensors, all of this is a number somewhere. You have to move these numbers around. You have to make them sing and do interesting things. You have to know math. Lots and lots of math. So my suggestion would be take as much math as you can stand while you're in school. At least calculus. Okay, at least calculus. As much math as you can stand. Because these are your tools. This is a toolbox. When you, you know, this is in computer science. This is learning the algorithms, not learning how to format your for loop. Getting beyond the algorithms, if you want to build algorithms, you want to design algorithms, the pieces, you know, an algorithm is typically like a series of steps, right? The pieces that make up those steps are math. And when you start to get into interesting problems, you need interesting, powerful, abstract math to solve them. So as much math as you can stand. And then some more. Take the basic track up to calculus. 
if that's as much as your brain can hold, and that was as much as mine did, I got to calculus and said, took one look at DiffEQ and said, yeah, we're not going there. <laughs> uh, if you're really worried about your GPA, audit the class. Or don't even audit, just sneak in. I mean, you know, <laughs> the idea once you get to at that level, I mean, you know, I, I like to tell people, when I was doing RFA and I was doing vehicle physics, I use calculus every day. Have you ever been one of those persons that was in math class was like, when are we gonna use this? You're missing the point, <laughs> okay. If you don't know that this math exists, you will never use it. So take math beyond your ability to do it. Because if nothing else, you know, oh, there's this system for doing it. There's this you know, class of thought for doing that. There's this type of math that addresses these type of problems. That, you know, knowing is half the battle, right? Okay, so knowing it's even out there is often more important than actually knowing how it works. So, uh, let's see, some suggestions. Graph theory is really useful. Um, set theory. Let's see. Uh, linear algebra. Linear algebra is a must. Okay. If you're doing 3D, you have to know linear algebra. Cult. Dot products, cross products, vector math, matrices math. Everything about 3D graphics is linear algebra. And, I mean, really, it's like cross products are one of those things. It's just like, yeah, and you'll actually see people at the studio. They're like, let's see this. Okay. <laughs> uh, I get a whole story about right hand, left hand rules, and our games are mostly left handed, but our physics system is right handed, and yeah. <laughs> uh, if you have to stop and you know think about what is a cross product, uh, really, I mean, th th this is the type of thing that if you want to do theory graphics, you really just need to know the stuff, like it was add addition and subtraction. Um, knowing why. Knowing what a class of you know, math operations or a, a school of thought in math or a category in math, knowing why, knowing the fundamental reason of what do I do with this? What number, what does this number mean that popped out of the end of this equation? Is much more important than knowing how the math works. Okay, you might need to know cross products just like that because you will be using them all the time. Can you write a highly optimized cross product function? Uh, I'd have to get my textbook out, but I guess, you know, I don't care. My vector class has a cross product operator in it. Somebody who was really smart spent a whole lot of time highly optimizing it for, you know, this processor on this platform. I don't care how the, you know, the cross product works, but I know when I need to use one and I know why I'm going to use it. You know, I remember learning dot products, I think it was junior high, or late junior high, early high school. Okay, here's this thing called vectors, and you can, look, you can calculate a dot product like this. And like, okay, I have a number. What's it mean? Well, there wasn't story problems in that lesson, so we didn't know, right? You know, here, go do 20 of them, don't worry about it. Uh, it wasn't until my senior year of my undergrad, and it was in my 3D graphics course, not my math class, when I finally understood, that's what you use dot products for. They're hugely useful and tremendously powerful. You use them all the time in 3D graphics, but I had no idea what this number was until then. So some of the whole, you know, why are we learning this? When am I ever gonna use it? You will put those pieces together if you have the foundation of that math available. Okay, so enough of that. Writing is the next one. I'm gonna take this to be a little broad. You know, this is expressing an idea to another person. It may be in written form, it may be in oral form. But the fundamental idea I'm getting here is you're moving a concept or an idea from one person's head to another. Must have excellent oral and written communication skills. It is in every job description out there. Okay, Volition doesn't have an open programming position right now, so I had to grab this one. But, you know, there it is, right there. Excellent communication skills. You are in a big team. You have to move ideas around, you have to do it efficiently, and you have to do it effectively. Bandwidth of human language is very, very small. Very small. 
how fast I can speak to you or how fast you can read in the bigger scope of things, you know, cognitively compared to your visualization system, even your auditory system. My ability to move words from my, and move ideas and complex things from my head to yours in a way that you can, can internalize, conceptualize, and grasp that idea is painfully slow. That's why you know, classes are a whole semester instead of an interesting lecture. Boom, got it all, right? No, it's painfully slow. Many of you have probably heard this idea that you know, if you're talking to someone, body language is 80% of what's you know, the communication that's going on. And I won't argue that. What I will point out, though, is to me, what that example is pointing out is not that body language is this amazingly high bandwidth pipe of information. It's that language is really, really small. <laughs> so you have a very small pipe, and you need to use it very, very well. You have to use it effectively. Great ideas that are stuck in your head that you cannot explain to someone else don't exist. If you have an idea, if you have you know, an algorithm, if you have an approach to this problem, a solution, if you cannot explain that to your boss, if you cannot explain that to your coworker, the idea may as well not exist. If it is stuck in your head and you can't get it out, it will remain stuck there. The pipe to get it out is clear and effective communications, usually in written form. You're usually expressing very large, very complicated ideas. It doesn't work over coffee or over beer. Uh, you know, white papers exist for this reason, right? Communication bandwidth is slow. You have to use it well. Language counts, okay? My name is misspelled on my badge. Guess what my first reaction was when I saw that? You know, what idiot? It's right in the program. It's right on the web page. It's wrong on my badge. It's wrong on all the posters in a different way. <laughs> you know, I mean, okay, yeah, names have special priorities. I'll grant you that. And I'm also granting that at least one of you spotted a spelling mistake in my presentation because I found realized too late that this software doesn't do contextual spelling, and I will admit I'm a horrible speller. But, I mean, you've all heard the story, right? You know, if you have a spelling mistake on your resume, tch, tch, trash, doesn't even look at it, right? I mean, you, the fastest way that you can convince someone you are a moron <laughs> is open your mouth and can you know, erase any doubt of it, right? You have to use language well. It counts. You know, I was reading, um, yeah, it was, a, a, it was a paper put out by a very senior engineer at Oracle. And, okay, yes, it was a paper on why no SQL databases are, you know, risky. And so you knew this, you knew the going in that this paper was going to be a bit of a sell job. But I'm like, okay, I want to read this white paper and see what they have to say and, you know, see how much I'm going to laugh at them, right? I literally got halfway through the first sentence and dismissed the entire paper because I hit a sentence construction that just hit me wrong. It was like, what? <laughs> I mean, you are a multi-billion dollar corporation, you are a senior engineer, and you, you, know, you couldn't edit this? Did you even read this before you put it out? No one caught this and said, you might want to rephrase this? And, and I mean, that was it. I, 14 page paper, I dismissed 90% of it halfway through the first sentence because of its construction. Because it was awkward, because it was misrepresented. And so it went from a, you know, who knows, he might have something interesting to say, but I'll, I'll hear him out, to this is a total snow job and the paper is complete crap and not worth my time. It's all it takes. Um, let's see. Most of the leaders, most of the leaders, not necessarily in the sense of, you know, the people in charge, the people we go look up to, people we mentor, are good at communicating. Uh, popular blogs are typically defined by two things. A, they actually bother to post, and B, they're written well. A lot of times, the core ideas are not actually all that original or unique. What's unique is this person's ability to express that thought that you kind of had your head wrapped around to say, look, this is it. Not over here, this is what I'm talking about. 
it, that's about writing. It's about communications, not necessarily about the idea itself. Okay. One of the most powerful places this comes out in software development, not so much games, although this does come up in subsystems and so forth that you're handed to, though, is design documents. Design documents are critical to successful projects. Somebody needs to sit down and say, look, this is what we're actually trying to build. And if you have a team of 100 people, it becomes amazingly critical. Because everyone, you know, it's like, yeah, we're trying to build that thing over there. No, you need to define it. If you have the ability to write, if you have the ability to express complicated ideas so that other people can do them or, or understand them, you can write design documents. And you might think, <laughs> why do I want to write design documents? That sucks. It has nothing to do with code. You want to write design documents because this is where all the power is. <laughs> okay? You can be the most junior person on the team. And if you say, well, I'll write the design document, they will hand you everything. Okay? When you're sitting there coding along, you know, again, micro decisions, right? Oh, I'm going to design the function this way. I'm going to put the loop here, and I'm going to put the initializers and all this. And I wanted these parameters. I want to pass it back. When you do the design document, you get to design the whole thing. <laughs> Every paragraph, every sentence, you are making dozens of decisions. How does this thing fit together? How do the pieces interact? How do we even define the pieces? Where are the boundaries? All of that is in the design document. And if you write it, you get to make it all up as you go along. It's way more powerful than any source file you can ever edit. And I'll tell you a little secret. Here's the way you do it when you're a, jun a junior member of the team. Right? Oh, I'll, I'll write the design document. Okay, fine, you know, here, nobody else wants to. And you write it, and you write it. And then you, when you get your first draft done, you say, okay, you mail it out to the team, and you say, look, guys, this is a living document. I, I'm not asserting this is the way we're going to do it. What I have done is we need to have a discussion on this. So I've put a stake in the ground. I've said, look, okay, we're going to build this. And please send you know, comments or questions or whatever. And if you think we should build this, let me know, and we can update the document. And you will send this out to your team of you know, 20 managers and 100 people, and two people will reply telling you that you misspelled a word on the third page, and that's it. <laughs> and now your vision for what this product is about has really become what this product is. Six weeks later, when they start to build it, and they start building foundation pieces, they might be, wait a minute, I finally reviewed that part in the document where you said, and you know, we don't want to do it that way. Well, management already signed off on it, and you already had a choice, to, or, you know, chance to look at it, and I'm sorry, we've already built the first foundation piece, and we can't swap out the foundation because we've already built the first two floors, too, so you're stuck with it. <laughs> Design documents are incredibly powerful. They're a very, very good way to assert yourself, assert your ideas, and because programmers are programmers, a large part of us go, I don't want to write any of this. So if you're the why, I'll write it. It's a way in. I mean, it is an incredibly powerful way in. Um, I've actually used, the other thing that, that design documents are very good for is uh, I've used them defensively. I was in a situation with the, the current project that I'm in where uh, I was being asked to do something that was very poorly defined. I was going to have almost no manager oversight at all, and I was going to be cast off for about a year and a half to get this thing done. And I had this sneaky suspicion it was going to be a very, very important cornerstone to future projects. Uh, and I'd been in this position for, before and gotten completely screwed. Because you go off and you think, okay, I know exactly what they want. I'm going to build it. It's going to be great. It's going to run fast. And you work and work and work, and you get to the end of the year, and you're like, look! And they're like, no, that's not what we said. Like, but but you suck. We're not going to give you a promotion. <laughs> so when I found myself in this position, I'm thinking, okay, there are so many things that can go wrong with this position. So the first thing I did is I sat down for six weeks and wrote a 50-page document that explained in great detail everything that I was going to do, why I was doing it, why it was awesome, and why it was going to save the company money. And sent it out to everyone with the, okay, you know, this is what I'm going to do. If you think I should be doing something else, please let me know. And nobody did. So I went out and built it. Came back a year later. Like, look, that's what I said I was going to build. 
this is what I built. See how they perfectly line up? Give me lots of money. <laughs> As it turned out, I actually didn't need to do that because once, uh, uh, once I had written this document and said, you know, look, this is what I'm trying to do, my boss mailed it out to our finance person and mailed it out to the, the team leads from other studios. And they all said, oh, wow, you know, we didn't really understand what you were trying to get at, but now we get it. We understand. We get what you're trying to do. And we like it. And we think it's useful and we want to support that. And everything was great. So it was really valuable to my manager as well because he could sell the project, you know, here's this wonderful document on exactly what we're doing. So never underestimate the power of a design document. Uh, I can say very clearly that my ability to write and express ideas, you know, and this has nothing to do with the O'Reilly book, trust me, that's the worst way in the world to make money. <laughs> On a dollar per hour basis, it's horrible. But writing has been the largest factor in my success, or success in my second half of my career. You know, the first half was kind of, what's this programming thing all about? How do real world teams work? You know, all that kind of thing. Uh, going beyond that, going beyond, I've become a very good programmer. It was mostly about writing, mostly about moving those ideas that I have to other people. Okay, so how do you improve your writing? Oh, yeah, one other thing. There are 16 speakers at this year's conference. A uh, little quick Googling said seven of them have written books. Three additional ones uh, routinely publish white papers or, you know, what they do in academia. Large, large written documents, technical documents, right? So 10 out of 16 people have significantly published works, okay? We're here because in theory we have something interesting to tell you. That's what it's all about. So how do you improve your writing? Read. And you read critically. Um, when I said, if you haven't read this, you should. I wasn't kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of books on software engineering, on how to program, on how to manage software teams. Most of these problems have been looked at, addressed, beaten to death. You know, the software industry is not new at this point, okay? Billions and billions of dollars have gone into countless projects. People have figured some of it out. Build on their achievements, you know. In 10 minutes, this is what I came up with. Joel on software, if you haven't read everything he's ever written, you should. <laughs> he has a, it, and a lot of this too, you know, a lot of his ideas are not groundbreaking. But he has this ability to narrow and focus and say, look, this is the important part. The rest of this is just fluff. Really, really uh, good, good understanding of the core fundamental issues. Um, you know, refactoring, it's mostly a pattern at this point. Very two classics, writing solid code and code complete uh, from Microsoft. Been around forever, you know, considered Bibles in software development. Soul of the New Machine is actually um, a narrative. It's about uh, designing a new CDC processor in the, the 80s. And it's a very good counter to Mythical Man Month because in story form, it shows that idea of you have a product, and you have a shippable system, and there's a huge distance between them. But it shows that in narrative form as this team goes out and tries to design a processor and design a computer to go into it. Uh, Deep Sea Secrets, this is, um, Vanderlyn was, uh, he's actually in the compiler team at Sun, I believe. But, you know, I thought I knew C. C was the language of choice when I was an undergrad, with C++ was starting to push its way in. I thought I knew C. It's really not that big of a language, right? Not that many keywords, not that complicated. And then I read this book and <laughs> my mind was blown. Um, read critically. Now that's, there's two parts to that. One of them is, you know, like this, this oracle paper I was talking about. When I'm reading the statements that this person is making and the footnotes that say, you know, and here's my supporting evidence. And you actually go read those footnotes and realize they have nothing to do with the point they were trying to make. And it's not really lining up. So read critically for information. Does this person really make sense? 
I mean, the fact that you have an email account today's world probably means that you're pretty good at this, you know, <laughs> send mail or type, you know, click this link. And you're like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. But it applies to technical papers as well. I mean, you know, not everyone out there really knows what they're talking about or totally understands the problem before they go write their article about it. Read critically for information. Don't be afraid to question what's being said there. It's the best way to learn. But also read critical for the structure itself. Does this sentence structure make, make sense? What exactly are they trying to say? Well, this, was this passage clumsy? Okay. The biggest success I found, the, the biggest improvement, okay, let me back up a second. If my sixth grade English teacher realized that I published a book last year, she would probably just keel over. <laughs> okay. I hated English class through high school. I was sucked at it. I mean, the concepts were not that hard, but go write a paper that explains this. I could never do that. The one thing that made me able to write my book was those dozen tech reviews that I did before. Where somebody hands you a book and says, you need to read this and, you know, first and foremost, verify that all the technical information in this book is correct. That we are not selling mistakes, so to speak. The second thing that I always did, though, which was what most authors either loved or hated, was, you know, this sentence doesn't make sense. You phrased it poorly, rephrase it. I had to reread this paragraph three times before I understood what you were trying to get at. It's broken. Fix it. And you are allowed to say that. Most technical books and most textbooks are broken. This is my fundamental rule. Like I said, if I have to read it more than twice, you know, I'm awake, I'm refreshed, I'm not reading at 2 in the morning, I haven't had three beers, right? Okay, I'm in a good learning mood, and I had to read this paragraph twice, and I still don't know what's going on. That doesn't mean I'm broken. It means your damn paragraph is broken. It's not your fault that those textbooks don't make sense. <laughs> Most of them are not actually written all that well. They have their moments, but quite frankly, I mean, you've probably seen this, right? It gets into a complicated idea or the really core idea of something much bigger, and suddenly it just goes opaque, and you're like, where did they go from this? What are they talking about? You know, it made, the first half of the chapter made sense, and the last half makes sense, but this one important piece, I just, you know, and yeah, writers get lazy, and they just, you know, and then miracle happens, and <laughs> okay, so, you know, I would, and, and my own book, of course, went through a tech review process where I had people reading my stuff and providing comments. And I pounded on them about this. I'm like, look, if you have to reread it, mark it. Because I want to take a look at it. I want to say, can I make this better? Can I make it flow? Can I make you get it the first time? It's really, really hard to have people do this. If you're in user interfaces, it's really, really hard to convince people that, uh, you know, if they don't understand the program, it's not their fault. I just realized I'm like so far behind at this point. Okay, don't make the same mistakes then. Uh, learn to be critical with your own writing and don't make those same mistakes. You know, take that skill, be critical of your own stuff. If it's not working, fix it. And it's really hard to say, you know, trial and error, right? <laughs> that's broken. Okay, let me try it this way. No, that's broken. It's hard. It takes a long time. You will get better at it. So, three R's. Uh, real quickly, since I know you guys want to get off to dinner, I guess it's what, it's a quarter after? Or? Uh, I-15, okay. Well, I'm not quite as late as I thought. Uh, let's see, we talked about that. Practice your craft. Practice makes perfect. Build your own experiences. Um, if you want to grow and evolve, you need to build your own experiences outside the workplace. You only learn so much there. Uh, so it's, it's, this is taken from Harley Davidson. This was actually the theme of, of Reflections Projections 96. Live to code, code to live. Uh, of course, it's not actually about coding. It's about building things, right? You want to go out, you want to have an idea, try it. Okay, if you are one of those people who just lives for software development, you should be living for it. Um, yeah, I mean, they're all, you can't do it all the time, and you definitely need to kick back and you know, find a different hobby. But uh, if, it's, if it is your life's work, you need to be doing something with that. It's something that you, you, know, you should be inherently thinking about all the time. 
absolutely code outside of class. Code outside of work. Build those skills. Try something new. As I said before, your CS degree really probably didn't teach you very much about software development. You need to fill those holes. Uh, go get involved in an open source project. Just download one. Start reading the source code. Understand. Expose yourself to different ideas, different techniques. Uh, I have a story about a long conversation I had with the uh, associate department head here about software engineering versus the CS degree they gave me that I didn't want, but you know, another time, maybe after dinner. <laughs> okay. The, the number one important thing I can say is build projects. Build complete projects. They don't have to be big. Set yourself a goal, though, and get there. Go through the whole process. Go through the design process. Go through the code process. Go through the revision process. Go through the, wow, this is great. This is just what I want. But now that I've built it, I realize I'd like to add these three features. And now I need to change the code to do that. And now I need to, you know, go through that process. You will only learn it by doing it. And there's nothing limiting you. Like I said, you don't need to do this as part of class. You don't need to do this as part of work. I know the ACM chapter here, very project focused. You know, as I said, I spent more time in the ACM office coding up quirky little projects than I did in class to the detriment of my GPA. <laughs> but, but I would argue I came out with a lot more real world experience. So build something. You know, learn the pipelines, learn to take it from idea to finish thing. It doesn't have to be boring. Pick something stupid. Pick something fun. Uh, I needed to learn, well, I wanted to learn uh, a little language that we use at work sometimes that I'd never touched before. So I said, OK, I need something to do in this language. I know. I will write a computer program that solves Sudoku puzzles. <laughs> Why not? You know, it, and it was interesting because, OK, yeah. Part of it was a fascination with this puzzle process and how do people actually solve these and what is the bare minimum number set of rules that you need to solve one of these puzzles. But it was a good excuse to sit down and say, okay, I'm actually going to learn how this language instance classes, how it does reference counting, how it does this, how it does that. And it was something stupid to carry me along that process, okay? And it was fun and silly and I had a great time and I learned the language. So it doesn't have to be monotonous or, you know, don't have to go out and build the next word processor or anything. You know, don't have to, I want to write a text editor. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, building something is important. It doesn't necessarily have to be serious. Just move yourself through the process. Okay. A little bit more practical if you're actually trying to do games or other professional development. Uh, one of the things that is not really taught at all is source control. Most large teams live and die by their source control system. It is arguably as important, if not more important, less used, but more important to the tool than your editor. Okay, Source control is everything to a large team. At Volition, if the building burned down, Okay, we need two things. We need all the people to show up somewhere, and we need our source control server, which is why we have one on site, one backed up across the street, and another copy of Phoenix, and I think there's at least two more copies that float around. Source, you know, learn how to do branches. Learn how to do integrations across branches. Learn to tag. Learn to, these are all just basic fundamental stuff about getting software development done in a team. And again, small projects in class and whatnot, you usually just won't touch this stuff. Um, for people that are curious, so most of you probably know, you've probably heard of Subversion if you've never used it. It's a very popular open source software control or, or software repo or code repository uh, source control system. It's pretty good. I like it. I use it for a lot of stuff. O'Reilly uses it for everything. I wrote my book by checking in XML files to a Subversion server. It's pretty cool. I could issue commands to it. It would build the PDF, and five minutes later, I'd have the PDF of what I wrote in exactly their format. Uh, it was a very, very easy way to work. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with it, Perforce is a commercial uh, system. Uh, every game studio that I know uses Perforce, mostly because if you look at something like Saints Row the Third, which is the title Volition is putting out next month, um, I, 
it's been a while since I double checked these numbers, but roughly the source repository for Saints Row the Third, which includes a lot of the art assets, is three terabytes and includes approximately half a million files. There is no other source control system out there when you have 120 to 150 people checking in and you know, synchronizing that much data that will not roll over and die. Uh, I don't actually like it all that much. It has a couple quirks that I could really do without, but it's the job done and nothing else does. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> Visual Studio, know it, love it, or don't because no. <laughs> I hate Visual Studio, but you still have to know how to use it. Um, console development, PC development, you know, almost everything does through Visual Studio. If you're, you know, not surprisingly, if you're doing Xbox stuff, you use Visual Studio. If you're use, doing PlayStation stuff, you use Visual Studio. If you're doing Wii stuff, you use Visual Studio. It's pretty much everything is there. Okay. The IDE is a very, very powerful, very complex tool. Know how to use it. Know how you build solutions. Know how you build projects. Know how you organize very large things. Know how you completely build or automate your build process so that every single file conversion, every single make step happens when you load it and hit build. Most people don't know how to do this and the ability to stand up and say, yes, I can do that integration or yes, I can add this third party tool and do it in a way that the rest of the team works makes you very, very valuable. So understand Visual Studio. Uh, if you're looking to learn languages for games, these are the two I would recommend. Most studios that I know use Python for all of their uh, scripting needs and tools, the in-house stuff. Lua is a language that a lot of you probably not heard of, but it's a, a highly embeddable language that makes it very easy to uh, encode behaviors and basic functionality in a scripting language that you can then easily and trivially embed in a large C program. It's a neat little language. It's huge in the game industry, just enormous. In fact, a lot of the reasons why Lua has become popular in the last few years is thanks to the game industry. Uh, OpenGL, Direct 3D, whatever. Learn some 3D graphics library. Understand what transformation matrices are. Love your dot products and cross products. Get your feet wet in 3D graphics. Uh, OpenGL is fairly easy to find, so it's a good choice. Um, it isn't actually used for a lot of things in the real world, but you know it's a good starting point. So you know, pick up some practical skills. If you're into games, there you go. Try it out. Um, one more practical skill: learn to type. Really, seriously, how many of you can actually touch type? If I gave you a keyboard that had nothing on it at all but dark black keys, how many of you could type out a letter? Really? You can touch type and make you close your eyes? <laughs> if that's true, you guys are highly unusual because something like 80% of people in the software industry cannot type. You can pack really fast with three fingers, I'm sure, but you cannot type. Learn to type. Okay. That's just a pet peeve in case you haven't. <laughs> Um, and everything else really is about attitude. You know, you, uh, you have to embrace teams. Everything is done in a team these days. And those teams, as I said before, are mostly not programmers. Programmers are in the minority. The, ma the majority of people are artists and production. You have to be able to talk to these people. <laughs> they think very differently than you do. This left brain, right brain thing, it exists, it's true. They think differently. You need to be able to communicate with them, you need to be able to collaborate with them, you need to be able to solve problems with them. Uh, this is not always easy because they see a different problem than you see. A lot of times meetings start out by, okay, what do you think is wrong here? <laughs> then we'll go on and solve it, but we need to be sure we're talking about the same issue. Um, artists just think differently. And if you fall into the trap of, you know, I have presented you with these facts, I have made these assertions, you did not come to the same conclusion that I did, therefore you are stupid. If you fall into that trap, you will destroy your team incredibly fast. He said, these people just think differently. You need to back up a couple steps. You need to say, okay, you know, what is the problem we're actually trying to solve? Because it, it's human nature too, right? Someone will come to you and say, well, you need to do this. Like, well, 
that's impossible or incredibly expensive. Why? You know, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And you can't do that. You need, okay, well, why? You know, what problem are you trying to solve? Because you've come to me with a solution. But what I really need to know is what your problem is because I have a better idea on how to actually fix it in the code. I just need you to tell me what you think is wrong. This is a really, programmers that shift over to game design, this happens all the time. And it's just sort of like, no, you haven't looked at the code in three years. You have no idea how it works. Tell me the problem you're trying to solve. I will figure out how to solve it. That's a really, really important uh, uh, jump for a lot of people. Um, Strike teams are really common. A strike team is like, you have a problem, it's a big problem, it's holding up the whole team. So you take one programmer, one artist, one, you know, one project manager, boom, there's a team. Your life is this problem until it is solved. You need to be able to talk to these people. You need to be able to work with them. You need to be able to identify them. I have to admit, you know, and, and this collaborative type thing is really powerful. In, in Red Faction Guerrilla, I sat next to the vehicle artist, okay? I sat in a room with no other programmers. Me and the artist and a bunch of producers. It was probably the most successful time I've ever had at the studio. Because I could see every problem that he had, every frustration that he had. And every time something came up, I need to put animated suspensions in the game. Okay. Hey, Chris, how do you model these things? You know, how can I make it that I need these two data points to plug into my algorithm? And the modeler has to set those points. How can I do that? You know, or, the, or he would come to me and say, well, we need to put this visual thing in the game. Well, I can't do that. That's really expensive. We don't have that data, or we can't model that. But I tell you what, I can't do this thing that you want. But I can give you this piece, and I can give you this piece. Can we bring those together to fake it, to you know, solve your problem, but, or maybe the one right next to it? Is that good enough? Um, these type of things happen all the time. And if you can talk to these people, if you can communicate to them, things will go much, much better. At this point, I have to admit, I prefer to sit with the artists. I don't like sitting with other programmers. I know all their jokes. They're not funny anymore. <laughs> the artists just have more fun sometimes. <laughs> OK, so understand what you're getting into. How do you break into the game industry? Understand the game industry is not big. In fact, it's quite small. If you ignore for a moment, you know, flash games, web games, iOS, if you're looking at traditional PC games, console games, uh, things of that nature, right? Large established studios, basically. The global uh, employment in that sector is roughly 40 to 50,000 people. To put that in perspective, IBM employs half a million people, 10 times more. Okay, the global game industry is relatively small. So it's not necessarily easy to get into. I keep getting into it by accident, but. Um, so it, you have to be better than that stack of resumes. You know, yours has to come out. And it's even harder to do just out of school. I mean, these days, yes, the economy is real. Studios are shutting down. There are experienced people looking for jobs as well, and you get to compete with them. So you need to make yourself stand out. And part of that is you know, what this whole talk has been about, right? How do you elevate yourself above Code Monkey and make yourself valuable and make yourself employable? How you get in the door, OK, no games. If you're not a gamer, that's fine. Like I said, I'm not a gamer really either. I don't consider myself one. I would much rather sit down on the couch with a good book. But now also when I do it every day, yes, it's one of those things that the last thing I want to do when I get home is, is play something. But know games. Know what makes them work. Know a little bit about design that you don't talk, you know, you can at least talk the talk. And when I'm being critical of the design, not only the gameplay aspects, but the technical ones as well. You know, understand what graphics cheats this engine has and what visual fidelity this one is trading and all that kind of thing. Understand the game industry structure. Know what a studio is, know what a publisher is, know what a first party is, a second party, a third party, what those phrases mean, where the money goes. Uh, there's lots of info out there. I mean, I could put a series of lectures together on this. Unfortunately, I'm not really the person to tell you this, but uh, games, um, Gama Sutra, which is a game site about the industry, not about games, is a really good starting point. But there's tons of information out there. Know the industry you're getting into. I mean, really. Um, 
most of all, the biggest factor. You know, you got your resume, you spell checked it. <laughs> you sent it off, right? Okay, the biggest single thing you can do is build a game. You're coming to these people and saying, I love games, I love coding, I want to do it for a living, I really, you know, this, I've always dreamed of this. Well, okay, you've got a computer and you've got access to all these things. This thing you wanted to do your whole life, why haven't you been doing it? <laughs> you know, a PC game is very good. Um, for one thing, it forces you to use the same tool chain that we would. So, you know, and it doesn't need to be, you know, Call of Duty one half, okay? It does, you know, <laughs> small scope, right? That's the whole idea. Don't necessarily big build, big build large. We'd much rather see something that's complete and is a simple puzzle game than, you know, this grand vision that you had that, that six months into it you realized you were started a five-year project and sorry, I didn't finish it, you know? Understanding those, recognizing those things is very powerful and very important. And so we want to see something complete, size is less relevant. Build something. You know, if, if it's a flash game, fine. You know, at least it shows that you're putting an effort forth. You're trying to say, I have this idea, I want to bring it to life. Uh, Microsoft has a program called XNA that lets you d download uh, and build stuff for the Xbox. You know, Awesome, awesome, really good, really good. Uh, there's a little bit of money involved there, but um, it, you guys can probably afford it. I think it's like 100 bucks a year or something. Same thing, the, the iPhone uh, cost for their program. Uh, iPhone's great too, and you know, who knows? If it's a good puzzle game, you might make some cash. So, Or you might be the next Angry Birds. <laughs> no, you won't, really. <laughs> Even indie games typically have about a $100,000 budget. But um, really, just build something. I mean, like I said, the biggest single thing that you can do. An artist shows up with a portfolio and go, wow, look at all the wonderful things you did. A programmer needs to show up with something. And that PHP code that you wrote as a part-time web developer last summer, we don't care. <laughs> okay. So build something. If you're going to throw the, the, the DVD in with your resume, that's great. Include the source code. We're going to look at it. Um, so that is probably the one biggest thing. Well, OK, yeah. learn to write. And then to get into the industry, build something. Uh, don't ignore the hiring process. Okay, there's actually the whole task of getting the jobs. Kevin Fanning used to be the recruiter at Volition. Great guy, bizarre sense of humor. <laughs> uh, this book is, is, it's only 40 pages long. You can get off his website for like five bucks. He's spent most of his career as a recruiter and hire in the game industry. He's not kidding about you know, actual information from someone that at least has a clue how it works. He hired me. Um, I'm not necessarily saying you, know, you have to get this book, but I'm saying it's a great starting part if you're curious about the process itself. You know, don't have those wonderful ideas and then blow it by calling them three times a day. Did you get my resume? Did you get my resume? No, we don't care. But OK, so um, I guess that's it. <laughs> You're wrong. <laughs> yeah, in fact, we had a discussion about this in the studio, and the entire idea of distributed source control got shot down so fast for some very legitimate reasons. I mean, I. For open source, I absolutely agree with you. Um, there's a lot of motivations and team distribution and everything that, that the whole distributed system is great. Understand that in a game studio, you have 100 people and they're all in the same building. You have, you know, half million dollar sand storage systems that do block level replication to Phoenix as soon as that thing is written to disk. We, I mean, the infrastructure we build is just very different. This is, so I, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily argue with the idea that, you know, subversion is not the product you should learn. And okay, fine, I don't care. My point was not that subversion is there. My point is learn source control, okay? Because at the end of the day, like I said, you know, I've never seen a studio that didn't use Perforce. Um, and, and as I said, you know, this conversation has come up and it was just like, no, distributed does all this stuff with all this overhead that we don't need, don't want. And, and really, I mean, You'd be surprised that, and you know, Subversion's right on this list, right? You'd be surprised at how many source control systems, when you throw half a million files at them, just roll over and die. 
And well over half of our assets are huge binary files, you know, 20 megabyte post uh, uh, Photoshop files for our textures and stuff like that. Most, most source control systems just really suck at that. Um, and like I said, I, I, I have no, no love of Perforce other than it gets the job done. But I also know, you know, it's not free. So just get experience with something. <laughs> you know, I, it, and I would actually agree. You know, if you want to get an open source, those I get is, is phenomenal for that. And Mercurial, eh, I'm still making my mind up. Um, I, Subversion's just the classic model. But, okay. I'll tell you what, since you actually asked a question, here. You get a signed copy that's worth probably two bucks on eBay. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, I wasn't either. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess part of that is what of interest, you know, is it one of those, don't get me wrong, game, gaming is a great place to work. I mean, you know, you want to talk about a casual office environment? <laughs> we will not have a company meeting unless beer is served, okay? They just, we will not show up, management knows it. <laughs> I mean, yes, they do networks and databases, but, you know, I do them in games, so that makes it awesome. <laughs> um, it's, it's a very interesting industry to work with. It is fast moving. Ask yourself what you love about it. You know, if, if, if the idea is I want to do games and I want to do programming, therefore I need software, probably not a good approach. If you're a software guy and you just love to build things and love to write code and you're all about the systems and that kind of thing and you say, can I apply this to games? Yeah, probably. I mean... In many ways, um, we have a very strong balance. Now, getting back to this diversity is strength idea, uh, you can go. We have a lot of people that have you know CS degrees, even a couple PhDs. We have a lot of people that come out of places like Full Sail, uh, which is a game and media academy. I don't know exactly how they try to sell themselves these days. It's a for-profit place, though, and. It's very easy to look at the people that come out of a program and be like, you're not a real programmer. I got my CS degree and I spent a lot of money. <laughs> you know? But uh, we, we actually had a program, well, like I said, we hire a significant amount, but we had one person who came out who totally changed my mind about that idea. Okay, yeah, he asked some questions that were like, you know, dude, that is like algorithms 101. You know, this, what, what is a stable sort versus an unstable sort? And he actually had to have someone sit down and explain what all that was. You know, what does a sorting algorithm do if the two things are this equal? Well, it depends on the algorithm. And, you know, it was sort of one of those, do you really not know this stuff? You know, how can you call yourself a programmer? Uh, but the flip side of that was, you know, he came out of the box. He, everything that he did, he did in Teams. Every, you know, he knew source control totally, absolutely understood what it was all about. He was producing value almost faster than most other people because he understood the process of software development. Now, his career development was slower because in terms of core skills, he was starting a little further back. But that diversity is strength. So if you're really into software but sort of into games, there still may be a place for you. You know, like I said, we've hired PhD people. We hired a whole bunch of people when Motorola shut down. You know, really, really techy kernel kind of folks. And there's a place for them, yeah. Um, if it's more of, you know, like I said, I want to get into games, I want to build games, and I think my path to doing that is programmer, you probably sound more like a designer. <laughs> And, and someone who's a technical designer is a great thing. I mean, you know, they're very valuable. But uh, if, if the core motivation there, what draws you is more, I want to build games. I want to, you know, I have this idea. I want to do this expression. I want to know how to improve that from a user standpoint. It sounds more like design. And that is, I mean, you can go out and get a degree in that these days. Well, not from too many places, but you can. And it's useful. So, I mean, really, I'd just say, what, do you, what, is, what is the passion there? Identify the passion and then follow that. How about this side of the aisle? <laughs>
Go out and write it. Seriously. I mean, I've done that. It's like, I keep having this problem. I keep having this argument. I'm going to put it in paper. And like I say, you do. You pull that trick where you're just like, well, I'm not trying to take this over. I'm not trying to step on anyone's toes. I'm just trying to get everyone's thought down on a piece of paper. And before you know it, it becomes a definitive document. I mean, really, I, no one will task you with going out and writing it, especially in an environment where the mentality is not already there. You know, the, the importance of it is not understood. But if you just go out and write it, I can almost guarantee that you know one of two things will happen. They'll either go, you know, you're, the senior guy will make a big huff about you're trying to step on everyone's toes and take over, and bad things will probably happen. But you know, it's part time, so what the heck? <laughs> or you know, right? Or it becomes the gold standard. Um, so really, I mean, and, yeah, I, like I said, I've done that defensively myself, where I just said, you know, I am writing this. I, here's what I say I'm going to do. You have a chance to say yay or nay, and down the road, if you didn't say anything, that's a yay. <laughs> so, anyways, did you on the other side there still have a? Uh, game, game the game design process ends about three months after the game shipped. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, this is one of those things that, you know, this is you know, the conflict between designers and programmers, right? Because the programmers are like, we locked you in a room for three months. Why didn't you come up with, you know, why didn't you have this idea? Why didn't you solidify it? Why didn't you roll it over in your head until it's like, yes, it's perfect? Because as soon as you build it and sit down, I mean, games are very visceral. They don't communicate at... You know, unless it's like a puzzle game, you, they tend not to communicate at a very intellectual level. You're really after an emotional trigger and response. And you constantly build stuff that you're like, oh, this is awesome, it's going to be great. And you build it, and like, wow, is this boring. <laughs> it's cool for the first 30 seconds, and then it falls apart, you know. Or you can have totally, I mean, we have had bugs turn into, you know, features of the game. <laughs> like, did you see that idiot thing that just happened? Wait a minute, how do I make that happen on purpose? <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, it is a design is highly iterative, and that's kind of like getting back to this idea where I said strike teams are a big thing. Being able to do cross discipline, when a designer comes to you and say, "I really want to do this because we think it'll be great," you're like, "We so don't have time to put that in the game." You sit down and you talk about you know, what are you really after. If I give you these building blocks instead of those ones, can you still make your vision come true, or something that's close enough to your vision that we're all happy? Um, yeah, no, the design process is very iterative. I mean. Most of the, the, so typical game cycle is, you know, small team for a couple months, then you build up the programming team into pre-production, you get the basic idea done. You slam your way through production for a year, year and a half, and then you polish it, bug fix it, and kick it out the door. Um, and a lot of times, you know, as I said, with the budgets that we have now, this is very, very managed. And so, if you have an idea, there's a lot of times where like, that is awesome. It is perfect for this. We don't have time. It'll be in the next one. We're going through that with Saints Row right now. I mean, for the last two months, we've seen ideas that it's like, wow, write it off for the next one. Actually, we officially announced that we're doing another one. <laughs> I don't think we have, but well, you'd be. <laughs> But you'd be an idiot that if we put one, two, and three out, they've been really successful. Guess what our next project is? <laughs> You have no idea. <laughs> I, Saints Row is, I, when I came to Volition, I purposely got myself put on the Red Faction team because I could just not deal with the insaneness that was Saint Row. I mean, even some of it, it's like, you know, I, a producer, I think, was it a, what, what, who was it? One of the producers basically, no, it was a marketing guy. He was trying to explain Saints Row. He's like, it's that awesome game that you would never let your kids play and you won't admit to your parents that you worked on it. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that about sums it up. <laughs> we have a four-foot purple dildo in our game that you can beat people to death with. <laughs> Top that. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, 
It's a fun place to work. <laughs> Anyone else? Way in the back. Most of the people in the first category are actually in the second category. I mean, right? Because if you come in without specific knowledge about, you know, like you're a programmer and you want to do games, uh, with the stress on the and there, right? Um, when most people come in, you know, I've played all my life. I love playing. I love the features in this game. I hate, you know, what they're really talking about is the design of the game. You know, not, wow, look at the texture shader in that one compared to this one or something like that. Um, and, and, yeah. And, I don't want to dismiss, like I said, I don't want to undercount the idea that in most studios, it's an open floor. I mean, I can walk into the producer's, walk up to the producer's desk, I can go to the chief combat designer and say, look, you know, I've been playing this and I, you know, have you considered this? Um, and they'll listen. I mean, unless it's, you know, way late in the schedule. They will listen and they'll think about it. And most of the time they'll say no and here's why. And you'll be like, oh yeah, I didn't think of that. Same reason why when a designer comes to us and says, you know, we want you to change this entire code base. And like, well, you'll break this, this, and this. You can't do it. Oh, right. Okay. You know, I guess a lot of it is there is an open floor typically when it comes to design. But at the end of the day, you have to respect that the game design is up to the game designer. That is their job. That is why they were hired. You must assume they are good at it. You have to give them that respect, right? So... Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, if the whole approach is I play games all my life, I like this one, I don't like that one, you know, you're immediately, that's a design thing, that's not a technical thing. Which isn't to say, you know, if you love programming, you can't bring those two together. But most of the time I hear a story like that, it's like, yeah, you're, you're one design. Anyways, again? Well, okay, in terms, of, in terms of the idea of, like, I have this awesome new thing, I want to put it in, that's a scheduling thing, you know. Is there time? Can I make a realistic estimate of how much this is going to cost in people and time and money? What is our budget? How, you know, what is our deadline? Where is it? This is, these are business decisions. They're management decisions. It's very, very hard to take something like a game where people are highly passionate about what you're creating and make sane, rational business decisions that don't step on a lot of people's toes. Thankfully, that's mostly the producer's job and project manager's job. Now, the flip side of that is when you have a design interaction where the designer comes to you and say, I really want to do this, and here's how I think you should do it. Well, the first thing you do is just kind of dismiss them and say, okay, let's start with the, I really want to do it, and I'm going to throw out your, and here's how, because that's my job. So you explain what you're trying to do. And then there's, I mean, it's a back and forth process, right? You need to understand what the core vision of their idea is. And then you need to figure out, my technical limitations are here. How can I deliver that? Without moving that vision very much or, you know, polluting it very much, they're happy because at the end of the day, they don't care how it works as long as it works. You're happy because you didn't have to rewrite half a million lines of code, you know? <laughs> and so, I mean, and that's more just... The biggest thing with that is when somebody comes to you and asks the impossible, don't get pissed at them. Okay, because chances are they're just missing a piece of information. They're seeing the problem differently than you are. And so the first step is not, what the hell are you thinking? You know, it's like, no, just chill out, step back and say, how can I help you with this? <laughs> you know? okay, what are you really trying to do here? Because what you're talking about, you know, what, what you have asked for is very hard, but I want to be sure that I understand this is actually what you're asking for even though that's what you said, because not everyone is great at expressing those ideas, especially when you're talking to someone, like I said, who fundamentally thinks differently. And I say that, you know, yes, the artists, I, I will say, you know, the artists fundamentally, most of them fundamentally think differently than the programmers. But I will add, that's not a bad thing. It just means you have two viewpoints to every problem. And there's been plenty of times, you know, like I said, working with a vehicle artist where you go back and forth and, and you build something so much bigger and so much grander because you bother to sit down and actually see each other's view. Uh, so a lot of it is just, you know, like I said, if somebody says something that makes no sense to you based off the information you have, the first thing you need to assume not is that the person is an idiot, 
but that you're simply working from different sets of information or from different viewpoints. And it's something that some weeks, you know, even those of us that have been doing it for 15 years need to take a deep breath. <laughs> Just, okay, I sent, you know, I wrote this furious email about what a moron you are, and now I'm going to hit delete instead of send. <laughs> Some days are like that, and it's really hard at the end when you know you're working long hours and you're stressed out, and everyone's worried about ship dates, and no one wants to take on more work, and you know tensions run high. So uh, that's a human thing, though. I mean, that's really about you know how do you interact on a team? How are you a professional? Which has very little to do with coding. What are you going to heckle me about? I had no idea it was going to be that big of a pain. Yeah, and, and I will happily change it for you. How about this? Oh, that's easy. And and a lot of times, like mis they're totally just legitimate misunderstandings that happen totally by mistake. I mean, I was on a team once where, I, I think it was Saints Row, actually, then, you know, the artist was doing clothing, and so they, you know, oh, we need, you know, 20 headwear. Any kind of hat or, you know, headwear. Because there's a huge customization system in Saints Row. And so, you know, so they're just slamming out sketches, like, con oh, concept artists, that's one I missed up there. So the concept artist will sit there and just make, you know, 100 sketches of headwear. Well, one of them was a ski mask. And, it just, you know, the programmers freak. They're like, do you have any idea how complicated the facial system is? And just like, that yeah, don't work. That's going to blow the whole schedule. What the hell are they thinking? You know, it was like, oh, ski masks are hard. You can only do, you know, ball caps. Okay, we'll just cross it off the list. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> like... You know, the concept artist had no idea. The artist had no idea. And it was like literally there. It's just the guy was going through a clothing catalog of every type of headwear. You know, type headwear into Google image search. So, okay, we'll do a, you know, we'll do a top hat. We'll do, <laughs> it's like, oh, and we'll do a ski mask. And we'll do, you know, and all of a sudden there was this big bomb sitting there. You know, it's like, okay, we'll just get rid of it. We don't care. <laughs> you fumed around and stormed around the office for a day and a half until you, you know, like, Really, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> There's a lot of that. I mean, like I said, and maybe that's something I should have put in there, but a lot of it is just learn what it is to be a professional, learn to work on a team, learn to get along, learn to respect your coworkers and what they do. Anyone else? Okay, go grab dinner. So I'm late. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around.